Does it work just like this? I don't hear any feedback. Um, Wait, this is not gonna. This is the microphone. It's for the. It's for the live. I see. So then that means I sh I should use this one. I see. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming on the night of the end of the day, week six. I know uh, it's been a very tough week for all of you guys, including me, but still, thank you for streaming out today. Um, I'm very happy to open the talk given by Professor uh, Liu Na today. She's going to be talking about the DNA engineered in nanophotonics. And Professor Liu and her team has received the 2019 Adolf Long Medal for her contributions to nano optics and metamaterial metamaterial research. So Professor Liu herself has researched uh, received her PhD in physics at the University of um, Stuttgart in Germany in 2005. She then worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of California in Berkeley. She then joined the Texas Instrument Visiting Professor at the Rice University in the USA. Now she is the professor at the University of Stuttgart. Uh, without further ado, I will hand this over to Professor Liu. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um... Thank uh, I would like to thank Jenny for the invitation and also thank uh, Cambridge University uh, Physics Society. Um, I will open the talk with the title DNA Engineered Nanophotonics. I'm from University of Stuttgart. Um, also, um, we are associated with uh, Max Planck uh, Institute for Solid State Research uh, as a fellow group. So here um, I was told that I should give a lecture for the undergraduate students, therefore I decided to um, start with uh, introductions, first to DNA nanotechnology and then a little bit about uh, keroplasmonics. Then uh, I will start really uh, the journey to present to you a series of DNA assembled photonic uh, building blocks. And then uh, along the way, I will also um, show you um, our perspectives um, about cell mimics towards synthetic cell. All right, so um, here I'm showing you this DNA structure, and uh, this is pretty much everyone knows. Um, but in this talk today, I want to convince you that uh, DNA is not only a very unique genetic material, it is also a constructed material that we are going to use to do monophonic on the we have two segments and they are kind of wrap up together. And it has a very defined structure in the sense that the diameter, we know this is uh, two nanometers. And then um, the pitch or the periodicity is uh, 3.4 uh, nanometers. So we know that we have A, T, C, and G, they are bases. So A and T, they join together, C and G, they join together. And this is what, what we know about the genetic aspect of uh, DNA. And then I would like to let you know that back in around uh, 2006, um, Paul Rosamond, so he is a researcher at um, Caltech. So he got the idea to fold DNA in order to create uh, nanoscale shapes and patterns. So what is this? So origami is a Japanese word meaning paper folding. So that means um, he wanted to fold uh, the DNA strands that I have shown you before into really um, more rigid and organized structures. So how do we do this? So he said, okay, instead of these uh, discrete strands, they are kind of 
quite flexible. Rather, I can let them work together in the sense that I have this scaffold DNA, which looks like a, like a loop. And then we input these shorter ones, for example, this one and that one. And then uh, they will find their ways to fold the scaffold DNA uh, through DNA hybridization. In this particular case, I have a uh, rectangle. We could also make um, a variety of different shapes, especially in three dimensions. And this gives us the opportunity uh, to make um, a template. For example, you can imagine if I have the different uh, nanoscale objects. In this particular case, you see this is a, a ghost runner rod, and this is the element that I will be um, I will be using uh, for the nanophotonic I divided it um, later on. So I just want to let you um, pay attention here. This is the ghost runner rod. And I could also position, for example, how uh, proteins or, or quantum dots and dye molecules. The benefit here is that we are talking about the resolution of several nanometers. It means that we can address these nano entities with uh, spacing on the order of uh, several nanometers. And this is uh, what I have uh, just talked to Jenny. This is very different from top down techniques. From top down techniques, um, detection of beam lithography or focused on beam matching, then normally we can go to the resolution on the order of uh, several tens of nanometers. So now, um, if we have this template, then that means in principle, we can organize any entities not on the nano scale, as long as we can um, code complementary DNA strands on the object, and then we can bend these nano structures on the template. So this is the uh, basic idea. And, um, and this is also a little bit introduction to the DNA nano technology aspect. So the next introduction, which is also very short, is about uh, chiroplasmonics. And then I'm going to combine these two aspects and then show you uh, the third topic in the talk. So chiroplasmonics. So first, what uh, is uh, chiro or chirality? Uh, so this word uh, is from uh, Greek. It means uh, handedness. For example, our two hands, we have a left hand and right hand. They are um, chiro. So, um, and in chemistry, left-handed and right-handed structures, they are enantiomers, and that means structure-wise, they are non-superimposable uh, mirror images with respect to each other. So then uh, why is chirality uh, very, very interesting? This is uh, because that in, in chemistry or also in biology, so for those uh, molecules which have the same chemical formula, but then if they have the, um, if they are in antimers, it means that very likely they could have very different physical properties and chemical properties. So then how do chemists analyze these uh, in antimers? So there is a standard technique called uh, circular dichroism spectroscopy. So what do people do is here, if I have the chiral molecule, and then, um, of course, many of them, and then we put them in into a cuvette. We send um, a beam, a light beam, and the light beam can be uh, manipulated to the left-handed version or right-handed version, and we call them light, um, right-handed circularly polarized light or left-handed circularly polarized light. Then um, I do the measurement of um, the uh, absorption spectra of the molecule First, for example, using right-handed light, a uh, circularly polarized light, and then I measure the same sample again um, using left-handed circularly polarized light. So then I do the, uh, the difference. So the uh, differential spectroscopy, meaning that I take the absorption uh, difference. So then in the end, I can result uh, in the circular dichroism spectra. On the right, you see a typical uh, circular dichroism spectra for uh, in antiomers. So here, um, the right curve and then the blue curve, they represent the molecules with uh, two different handedness. And this is very important because um, even though they have the same uh, chemical formula, then you found out that we can utilize uh, quite simple optical spectroscopy to distinguish um, the two different molecular species. And 
here, this is quite interesting. You see there is a black line in the middle and this is called a, rac a racemic mix. It means if I have the same amount of left-handed structures and right-handed structures, I mix them together. And then in the end, the, um, the uh, signal is zero because the, if they have the same amount, and that means uh, here um, they cancel each other. And this is a typical profile of the uh, CD spectra for a chiral molecule. So in the next, I, uh, next slide, I would like to take some time to explain to you why we get such uh, spectra from um, chiral molecules. And then um, before I uh, show you um, the uh, equations, I want to introduce to you that um, we have, over the years, researchers have tried to also build uh, artificial chiral molecules. Uh, the thing is that if you check this carefully, for example, for uh, DNA structures that I'm going to talk about, so DNA strands or proteins, normally uh, the CD response is uh, near uh, the UV range. And as long as the material is uh, specified, and that means the CD spectra is just fixed over there. And then if I have some means to build artificial ones. In principle, I can shift the resonance back and forth at different positions, and I can have a fully um, tunable CD response by building artificial uh, optical structures. And so this is the uh, motivation to do that. Regarding how to do it, I will show you um, in the next slide. So here I want to um, define, uh, give you the def definition of uh, plasmonic structures. So what I show you is a very simple and um, um, spherical nanoparticle. So for example, this is a gold nanoparticle. I'm talking about a dimension 100 nanometers in diameter. Uh, we could also use uh, silver nanoparticles. So then if you measure it, typically we can have um, a, an absorption spectra like this. And what happens is that at this resonance, for example, this is gold, and the resonance is around uh, 550 nanometers in this case, when light interacts with such a metallic nanoparticle, then the conduction electrons, they are excited to shake back and forth. So it's very similar to the case. So I have a, I have a bottle of water right here. And then um, just imagine that I have the, uh, the, the water inside and they are my uh, conduction electrons. So when these electrons, they are excited, and then you know this is the, um, the field direction of my, the uh, direction of my E field. And then they will follow the E field. So they shake them back and forth. And this is typically at a resonance. So that means if I measure the absorption spectra right here, over there, I see a resonance. At this particular resonance, we call it plasmonic resonance. I can have the excitation of the conduction electrons at a particular resonance frequency. So what uh, determines this resonance frequency? First of all, you see, this is very material specific. For example, gold, uh, typical resonance frequency in this dimension is around 550 nanometers, so silver, um, can be um, mild to the blue. And that is why uh, silver or aluminum, they are very um, well suited for UV plasmonics. And then we can also have co uh, copper or magnesium. So this depends on the um, plasma frequency. So um, this is the uh, material aspect. Another way we can change the resonance position is the size. The, in general, the bigger size the particle then the larger um, or the longer wavelengths, the resonance. So this is very easy to understand because if I have the, the shaking back and forth um, phenomena for the conduction electron, uh, conduction electrons, and then uh, so the, the longer this um, bottle, then the um, harder for the electrons to go through this shaking back and forth behavior. So that is, um, it means that uh, this is also the size dependence of the plasmonic resonance. Another factor uh, one could design uh, for the resonance position, for example, is the, the geometry. So this is just a spherical nanoparticle. I could also make um, go to nanorod, go to triangle, 
and all the structure parameters, the geometry will define the different position as well. Uh, the last but not the least uh, important uh, aspect is the environment. For example, if I uh, embed my uh, gold nanoparticle in water uh, compared to air, the refractive index N is increasing. And that means I could also shift the resonance mode to the red. So there are many ways to manipulate the resonance position. So now a little bit um, to the, um, the physics side. So what happens is that, as I have shown you, this is a typical uh, gold nanoparticle. And this is the direction of my um, electric field, as I said. Then the electrons would follow the direction of my electric field. So at the scale that I'm talking about, say uh, I have uh, gold nanoparticles, uh, 50 nanometers in diameter. And then the resonance I'm talking about is around uh, 600 nanometers. So uh, 50 nanometers versus 600 nanometers, and that is pretty small. So that means we are um, entering the, so to say, quasi-static regime. It means that the nanoparticle is so small and we can treat the behavior of the nanoparticle as an effective dipole. So you see this is the positive charge and then this is the negative charge and this forms one effective dipole. And the take home message is that um, in a quasi-static limit, when light interacts with such a gold nanoparticle, I can excite an effective dipole. This is very important. Of course, if we, we can also do uh, the qualitative uh, calculation to really derive uh, all the formula and then we will end up with the, uh, the same conclusion. But then I, in this talk, I'm, I'm not going to um, the details of the duration. In, in general, what we do is we go for the maximum iteration and then with appropriate boundary conditions. And then we can actually solve very accurately the resonance position and condition for the spherical nanoparticles. But say, if I want to go for a, a nano star, which has a very complicated geometry, then uh, the good thing is that uh, nowadays we can already have commercially available software to do uh, simulations for you. And in this talk today, I will just uh, use uh, spherical nanoparticles or those nano rods as examples. All right. I have told you that uh, first, with this uh, gold nanoparticle, uh, this one now looks like a rod. But in a quasi static limit, I can still treat the rod um, as an effective dipole. Instead of one rod now, I put another gold nano rod uh, below it. So that means in, in uh, space, I have uh, two effect effective dipoles instead of one. And you can imagine if I uh, position two gold nano rods to form two effective dipoles due to close proximity, then they start to couple. And this is very similar to the case in molecular physics. Uh, when two hydrogen atoms, they form a hydrogen molecule, and then the wave functions would be able to overlap. And then the energy level will split into bonding and anti-bonding modes. This is very similar to the case here. So I have two um, effective dipoles, they start to couple. And at the end of the day, they will also be able to um, hybridize to form bonding and anti-bonding modes. So now, why, um, how can we relate this? So why do I call this a plasmonic chirality? So here, you can imagine if I have uh, two dipoles, and then I start with a um, twist angle. And if I have a way to change the directionality of the top uh, e effective dipole, and that means I can change the chirality from left-handed to right-handed all the way. And that is why this is called artificial chirality. And because I'm using the plasmonic uh, nanostructures, this is called plasmonic chirality. And here you see the typical uh, CD spectral that I have shown you before. And it has the deep to peak uh, feature. And this is a typical sign for the uh, right-handed structure. If I change the direction of the gold nanoparticle on the top, and then I can also change the CD spectra at some point, then the spectra would uh, flip. And now if I have many, many of structures in this cuvette, then I can just measure the CD so that from the optical spectra, 
I can retrieve the handedness of the structure. And that will uh, help us to uh, identify uh, the motion that I'm going to show you. So now um, we, we need some time to understand what is going on in the coupled uh, electric dipole um, model. And in fact, uh, in physics, there is a very well uh, known model called uh, Brunku model to understand uh, the system. This is called twist a finger. So it's very similar to the case that I twist my finger or cross finger structure. I have uh, two gauge number rods. And then in this particular case, they are twisted by 90 degrees. You can do uh, any degree you want. So um, to derive the CD spectra uh, in a, um, using a calculation, then we can take um, the born model. And in the born model, it describes the following. So here, the electrons, they oscillate back and forth, for example, after excitation in this gold nanorod. And over here in the bottom gold, gold nanorod, I also have the electrons, and then they are excited in the gold nanorod. That means um, I can fairly trade this um, gold nanorod on top as a harmonic oscillator. And this is the oscillator one. We also have in the bottom another harmonic oscillator. And the important thing is that, um, as I said, due to close proximity, these two gold nanorods, they are coupled, plasmonically coupled. And that is why here, um, I have a spring and with this mass in the, in the, in blue, in the blue sphere, so this is one harmonic oscillator and this is the second harmonic oscillator. But then in between, I need another spring so that uh, this can represent the coupling between them. I can also give um, this coupling coefficient um, cosine in between. And so here, the two figure, um, they are different in the sense that one is a left-handed structure and then the other one is right-handed structure. So let's just use this one as the example. So what we can do is we can just write the equation of motion and X over here represents the displacement of the mass which uh, goes back and forth uh, around the equilibrium position. So then in the equation of motion, so this is the acceleration and then this represents the, uh, the loss of the motion. And then this one is the eigenfrequency. And this one I have highlighted with a red color over here. This represents the coupling between uh, the two harmonic oscillators. On the right, I have the um, excitation. And so that means I have the, um, the electromagnetic wave as the incidence. For example, I, I shine light at a particular uh, wavelength or in um, a broadband excitation. So then um, I can write down the coupled uh, equation of motions. And this one, this Y is the displacement for this oscillator and X is the, this, um, the displacement for this oscillator and they are coupled. So then I can solve the coupled um, oscillator using the brown cool model. And then in the end, what we can get, I, I have skipped the duration process. So then in the end, what I can get is here, the absorption difference from a chiral structure can be associated with these parameter, so uh, these parameters. So omega is the uh, frequency of my uh, electromagnetic wave, and C is the uh, speed of light. And this one, this is the imaginary part, imaginary part of the uh, effective refractive, uh, refractive index differences when uh, right-handed circular light and uh, left-handed circular light uh, interacts with such a chiral system. So this is the um, refractive index difference. And the interesting thing is that if I measure or I calculate the absorption difference, then the absorption difference is dependent on the imaginary part of the refractive index difference. And this is defined as circular dichroism. And if you check uh, the spectra over here, this red one, it typically looks like this. On the other hand, if I take the real part of this uh, refractive index difference, and then that will give me uh, optical rotary dispersion and we call it ORD. 
and these ORD and CD, they are uh, correlated because one is associated with the real part of the same parameter and the other one is associated with the imaginary part of the same parameter and that means they are Kramer's chronic uh, related if you have uh, learned optical properties of uh, uh, solids. So that means if you measure circular dichroism, in principle, you can derive already the ORD and vice versa. But here in this slide, I hope that you take um, the, the message that for typical Carroll structure, if I measure the absorption difference, then I get this uh, right curve and this represents one handedness. And if I flip the handedness of my structure and this um, curve will also flip, and that gives us the opportunity to really distinguish the handedness of the care molecules. Uh, after the short introductions uh, to uh, DNA nanotechnology and uh, periplasmonics, I want to show you the roadmap um, of the works that we have done over the years. And in this talk today, in the rest of the time, so I will, um, talk um, about the DNA, uh, the different dynamic building blocks um, built by DNA. And we tried to mimic the different uh, dynamic motions of uh, the molecular motors in living cells. And then I will also um, tell you um, one example about uh, optical sensing and then how to make the different building blocks into high order uh, architectures and then some perspectives uh, towards uh, the cell mimics. Um, so here, um, I'm showing you uh, very representative uh, molecular uh, motors in living cells. So here, this is the ATP synthesis. So what it does is that it sits on the membrane and it does the rotation motion and it effectively um, pumping protons against their electrochemical gradient. So that means it can perform the rotation motion. And then we also have linear motors. So this is the kinesin one and it can walk along microtubules, it can walk. And then we also have a sliding motor. So that means um, um, the, motor can do the sliding motion. And that is very important actually for our muscle construction, uh, contraction and stretching. So then over the years, we have uh, been utilizing the DNA nanotechnology uh, combined with optical spectroscopy to build artificial structures, which can exhibit very similar motions. And then meanwhile, we can utilize optical spectroscopy to read out these nanoscale motion in real time. So I show you uh, the very first uh, example. Uh, this is the, uh, so here I have written dynamic system uh, with rotation. So the first thing I want to do is to mimic the rotation uh, of the molecular uh, motor uh, ATP synthesis. And I start with a uh, chiral structure and you can realize that, so this is a cross or a cross finger structure. So I have two gold nano rods, as I have told you that then if I shine light, uh, the plasmos can be excited in this gold nano rod and plasmos can also be excited in this gold nano rod and they couple. So here, this is the left-handed structure. So that is why you see this is the peak and uh, dip feature in the CD spectrum. And if I do, uh, the right-handed version of the structure, then we can have the flipping uh, CD spectra re with respect to the profile of this one. So that means um, if we could uh, make a system like this, and I have these two gold nano rods, and here in this silver uh, colored uh, structure, so this looks like a, like a cross. Uh, this cross is made of DNA. And you see um, these bundles and each bundle represents a uh, DNA helix. So we utilize uh, the DNA origami as a template to host these two gold nanorods. And then in order to make the angle change so that I can change the configuration of the structure from left-handed 
uh, to right-handed, then I need to make sure that um, I have a way to um, have the um, manipulation uh, in space uh, to manipulate the angle between them. So how to do that? How to do that? In fact, we have uh, designed two DNA locks, uh, one on this side and the, uh, the other one is on this side. And the, in each lock, I have two DNA arms. So these two arms can be uh, closed and open to so molecular, molecular processes that I'm going to tell, tell you. This, this molecular process uh, uh, is quite straightforward. It is it's about the uh, repetition of among three DNA strands. Three strands. So, so I, I have, have three DNA strands. strands. Initially, this blue, blue one is, is hybridized with the green one. And, and if, if I input the DNA strand in right into the solution, then the red right one can, can successfully replace the blue one and be fully, fully hybridized with the green one. The competition comes from the fact that here, the blue one is only partially hybridized with the green one. Therefore, the uh, uh, right one can kind of uh, win the competition. And, and then in the end, the blue one is uh, out from the original position. The red and the green one, they are hybridized fully in the end. So I have the animation here. So originally, these two, they are hybridized. So now I input uh, the, the driving strand, I call it driving strand into the solution. And then this one can hybridize further and further so, so that uh, this one will be uh, displaced from its original position. And this process is called totally holding mediated strand displacement uh, reaction. So now I'm going to utilize this strategy to drive the system back and forth so, so that the angle between the two bundles and therefore the angle between the two golden number rods will change according to my wish. If we start with a relaxed state, it means that I have uh, the bubble locks which are both open and, and then I add the removal strand into the solution to trigger the toy hold um, immediate strand displacement reactions. So that here, now the two blue parts will be able to hybridize, and then my system goes to the uh, left-handed state. And if uh, we input other uh, removal strands, I can also change the system from the relaxed state to the right-handed state. Now, if I have ghost nanorods on top, so that means the uh, DNA frame is causing my two ghost nanorods. So here, I change the angle by inputting, by inputting the driving strand into the solution. And it's locked right now at the left-handed state. And if I add the uh, uh, strand in there, then this, this bundle will be uh, displaced from the original position. Now my system goes to the relaxed state. So depending on um, the, the weight of the designer, in principle, we can uh, change the angle back and forth. And these are the PM images uh, of the structures to just uh, um, give you the impression of the structures. So here I have the uh, origami frames, and uh, they look kind of uh, crosses. And then on this side, you see uh, the ghost number rods, which have been positioned on the templates. So then I have the uh, experimental results. On the right, I have these typical CD spectra. I showed you that the TP spectra, CD spectra are very sensitive to the handedness of the structures. And, and if we, in the experiment, we monitor um, the CD intensity at a fixed wavelength, say around uh, 750 nanometers, and then uh, when we input the driving strands into the solution, we can have um, here the switching of the optical signal, it means this goes to the left-handed state, and this is the relaxed state, and then this is the right-handed state. It means that when the um, DNA hybridized plasmonic uh, structures, they are doing this kind of uh, back and forth angle change into in the solution, then we can utilize the optical spectra to track the nanoscale motion. From the spectra, I will be able to um, know at what status the Golden Nano rods are and what kind of angle they are forming. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that originally, 
uh, when we did the experiment, we found that um, there were quite um, significant uh, performance degradation. So you see that uh, after one uh, cycle, then here the intensity drops. So this is due to the fact that uh, when we drive the system, we need to input the DNA strands into the solution. And that means when it introduces the dilution effect. In order to avoid the problem, later we also uh, came up with the strategy to make um, the system which can be uh, driven all by light. So that means instead of the DNA switch, one needs to introduce a light switch so that you don't need to input chemical mo uh, chemicals into the solution to induce the uh, dilution effect. Then, um, of course, the best strategy would be using light um, due to the fact that light is clean energy. It doesn't produce any waste. In order to make uh, the uh, structure uh, light responsible or light responsive, I would say, then we utilize the uh, ozobenzene molecule. So ozobenzene molecule has a very unique property. It has the photoisomerization. What it does is that the also benzene molecule, when it is in the uh, trans state, so that is a, um, a planar molecular uh, structure. We shine UV light, then the structure will be twisted into a three-dimensional configuration. If we shine visible light, then the uh, structure will be go back, go, uh, going back to the trans uh, state. So that means we can initiate the um, transformation between the two states simply by light. This is the intrinsic property of the benzene molecule. So now what we are going to do is we want to translate the also benzene transformation property onto our uh, origami structure or a plasmonic DNA hybridized structure. So here what we do is this is the intrinsic property of also benzene. And then we intercalate the ozobenzene molecules into uh, the DNA bases. So then that means this DNA duplex will become light responsive. We add, uh, we illuminate the DNA duplex um, by UV light, then the duplex can be dehybridized. And then if we uh, shine visible light, then um, the two strands will be able to um, be hybridized back and forth, so th this is fully uh, reversible. So now we transform this ozobenzene modified DNA duplex onto my uh, origami structure. So this red um, piece represents this one, um, which is ozobenzene modified DNA duplex. So then at the end of the day, here, this uh, structure with my plasmonic goat nanorods on top, it will be able to um, respond to UV light and visible light respectively. If we shine UV light, this switch will be opened so that my plasmonic structure is opened. Vice versa, if we uh, shine visible light, then the structure will be locked back to the locked state. So this is the strategy. And these are the uh, TM images. So here we have the uh, cross uh, structures. And here I just want to show you uh, the angle uh, from the design. In the experiment, what we do is we shine visible light and visible, uh, UV light onto the structures. Then along this direction, we input uh, the circularly polarized light to read the CD spectral uh, changes. And on the right, you see this typical CD spectra when the structures are in the relaxed state and when they are in the locked state. So it means that if we monitor the optical signal at 700 nanometers, then we will be able to track the uh, opening and closing of the structures. In the entire process, one doesn't need to input any chemicals. Rather, we... Um, it, open and close this uh, light responsive switch by a UV and a visible light. Meanwhile, we utilize a circularly polarized light to probe the, the spectral changes. And right here, you'll see the result. So here, um, 
we have the uh, switching behavior, which is very um, clear to see. And the important thing is that we don't have a significant um, performance uh, degradation anymore. So because we don't ut uh, utilize uh, chemicals which may introduce uh, dilution effect. All right, so the um, another example I would like to show you is the, um, the, the full rotation motion because I only have presented to you the switching just among several angles. In order to fully mimic the rotation behavior uh, of ATP senses, then uh, it means that it has the full rotation. One needs to drive the gold nano rod, for example, this one, from zero to 360 uh, degrees, counterclockwise or uh, clockwise, because uh, the rotation behavior is very similar to a clock. And that is why in this case, uh, we call the new structure a plasmonic nano clock. So we have this nano rod on top, and this is the, um, the rotor. We have the uh, stator, that is the second gold nano rod in the bottom. In this case, this one doesn't move, it is immobilized. So here we have designed a ring track right here, so that um, if you see from the top, this ring track has uh, 16 bending sides in eight pairs. We have this bundle. Um, in this slide, you don't see the gold nano rod, but the gold nano rod in the experiment, um, they, they are there. So here, this bundle is originally um, bound to position one and one prime by using DNA strands in black. We call them DNA feet. We add the uh, driving strands. We call them blocking and removal strands. So what they do is um, the two black DNA feet will be unzipped from position one and one prime. Then they will search the next available positions for example, in this case, two and two prime, and they will be bound to position two and two prime by uh, rotating an angle pi over eight. If I do this continuously, that means I drive this gold nano rod to pi over eight and then pi over four, so on and so forth. I can have a series of uh, CD spectral changes from zero all the way to two pi. And now if I track the maximum and minimum positions and I represent the data in this plot, the right curve represents the counterclockwise rotation. And after it reaches um, the, the final state, for example, to two pi, we can also drive it back. And here you'll see that the two data points at each angle, they agree quite well. So this is very important um, because only if they agree uh, very well, it means that the re reversibility of the rotation is uh, fairly good. So then um, another example I want to show you is that it is also possible that we don't introduce any human intervention. One can also design the autonomous uh, rotation system in a way um, by using DNA design. So DNA enzyme is uh, artificial DNA structures which can go through enzymatic uh, reactions. So just briefly to show you how it works, instead of uh, the two DNA black feet, now I have uh, two green strands. So they are DNA enzymes. The DNA enzymes, they can recognize the purple strand. In this case, um, they are RNA strands. I won't go into the uh, chemistry part. Uh, not right, I told you that right, right how it works. So this is the cross section of the, the ring track, so I see it from the side. So what what um, the hand press is that, that, that this is a um, new, new DNA enzyme strand. It, it can cut through the RNA um, substrates along the entire track as long as the reaction takes place. And this also um, enforces the directionality because when it walks from here to there, the strand behind are all cut away. And this is uh, the reason why the directionality is enforced mm, because there is no way for this uh, strand to go back as the track is burnt. That is why this strategy is also called burnt bridge strategy. 
And in this way, if we drive the system now to rotate, we can uh, do it in a fully autonomous way. Uh, we can control the directionality as well as uh, to where the, um, the rotor wants to stop. All right. Uh, over the years, we can uh, we we have demonstrated different ways to drive uh, plasmonic uh, nanostructures. I briefly have shown you the DNA strategy and with um, actually with light. So we could also drive the systems uh, with uh, pH control, concentration control, and really a variety of choices. So um, I also want to show you um, some example right here. Uh, this is uh, sensing. So because we are doing, doing optics, and then we have the uh, unique combination of the nanoplasmonic structures with uh, DNA, then this will enable us to do really very highly specific optical sensing. So here, this is only one of the examples. So here I have uh, this template. So instead of the full rotation, so now I just want to uh, take uh, two options. Along this uh, diagonal direction, we put uh, ATP aptamers. So ATP um, aptamers, um, so to put it in a very simple way, these artificial DNA structures, they can recognize ATP molecules. And then along this direction, I have um, the cocaine um, aptamers. It means that these DNA strands, they can recognize cocaine molecules. So now, if this is clear, it means if I have the plasmonic system in the solution, if ATP molecules are there, the structure will be directed to the left-handed version. If cocaine molecules are in the solution, then the structure will be directed to the right-handed version. So, and um, if we do the optical readout right here, so depending on the molecules in the solution, then we will be able to distinguish optically uh, the different molecular species in the solution only based on one single plasmonic platform. So this is just the, um, some example for the optical sensing part. Uh, the other uh, example I want to uh, show you is the uh, molecular walker. So on the title, I have written a dynamic system with walking. So here, what uh, you see right here, this is uh, the kinesin one uh, molecular motor. So it has two feet. And this one, which looks like a filament, this is microtubule. And this is what happens right now in your living cells. So this motor, it carries this uh, porting as cargo, and then it delivers uh, the cargo to different destinations. So we have uh, many, many, many of those molecular motors which do the work simultaneously in living cells, and they do the work in a fully intelligent and coordinated way. So then uh, we have developed uh, the um, plasmonic analog of such a motor. And in this case, we have this ghost nano rod, which can walk on the platform. So uh, you might have uh, realized that um, previously, the motion was always from my origami. So that means the origami structure carries the goat nano rods to move. In this case, this is different. The moving object is the goat nano rod itself. So here we have these, uh, we call them footholds. So this goat nano rod along its body, it is fully covered with uh, DNA strands. So the goat nano rod can roll or head or backward with the spacing uh, seven nanometers uh, per step. So I show you the, uh, the schematic over here. So this is the DNA origami platform. And this one, this is the, the walker. We input DNA strand into the solution to trigger the cohort strand displacement reaction. And then the goat nano rod can respond and start to roll. And every time it goes seven nanometers ahead. And if you check from the top, oh, I have this red goat nano rod over there in the back and that is immobilized. So that means I have the right-handed version as the starting point. When the walker goes to here, to here, 
Then I have the A carol version. And then go further, further, I have the right-handed version. That means if we measure just the spectra at these five different states, and we can actually identify very well the uh, CD signal changes. Again, if I fix the wavelengths around 700 nanometers to detect it, when a walker goes from left all the way to the right, one can see that we really have the optical signal changes. And each optical signal step over here in an experimental uh, plot, it means that corresponds to 7 nanometer um, nanoscale distance change in space for the structure. And 7 nanometers is um, well below the optical diffraction limit. But with this way, we just can use a standard optical spectroscopy to track such nanoscale distance changes uh, in real time. All right, um, I have uh, some time uh, left. I, I just want to have uh, another example for you. This is dynamic system uh, with sliding. So this sliding. So on the left, what you see is this is the um, a living cell. And then when a living cell is divided into two daughter cells, the entire process is actually very complicated. But if you check uh, this schematic, so here we have these red crosses over there. So they are uh, another molecular uh, motor called uh, kinesin-5. So they cross-link the um, green-colored um, microtubules and then slide them apart. Eventually, the cell is divided. And here we have built the um, optical analog over here. So this is the molecular version. We have the motor which cross link the microtubule and then the microtubules, they actually have uh, different polarity, opposite um, polarities. In this case, we have two gold nanoparticles and then we have the origami filaments. And here um, we um, can utilize the collective motion of the two gold nanoparticles to slide the two filaments back in the force. In order to track the optical response, we have uh, positioned two dye molecules over here. And uh, uh, I don't know whether you have learned um, FRET, so uh, fluorescence energy uh, transfer. So here that means um, the, the signal, optical signal between the uh, coupling of the time, dye molecules is highly uh, distance dependent, but it can only track the uh, distance range on the order of 10 nanometers. So then that means if I have here the two nanoparticles, they work together to uh, slide my filament back and forth. And here I have these two dye molecules and the dye molecules, uh, the distance between the two dye molecules will change over time so that I can track the, um, the signals in real time. Uh, these are just the TEM images I want to show you. Uh, this is the initial state, no sliding. I have the two golden nanoparticles in between. And then after two sliding steps, I have the asymmetry that can be introduced. In the experiment, we monitor the sliding process. So in total, we have five states. So here I can slide the structure to the left. I can slide the structure to the right. And then we track the, uh, the fresh signal and we can identify very nicely the different steps. And that means with a fresh spectroscopy, we can also um, distinguish the nanoscale motion. But in this case, this is the sliding motion. So I have um, really uh, not so uh, much time. Um, I, I decided I decided that I skipped the uh, the other example, which is um, a little bit complicated. And then I want to uh, show you the very last motion. So this one, uh, remember I, I have um, presented to you this uh, animation, the walker, um, which carries the cargo on on the on the head. So in the in the uh, living cell, we have many 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 of them which work together. And that means this brings us a very intriguing question also in nano optics. So instead of just one or two 
objects, nano objects that we can position uh, in my uh, optical device. And if I have many of them in this particular case, for instance, I have this origami uh, track. Instead of just one or two uh, gold nanoparticles, uh, I have six or I, have, uh, I could have many more. And there will be uh, several um, challenges to organize such optical devices because if everyone wants to move to build dynamic optical devices, so then in principle, I have first the issue, we, they, they need to share um, the, the same track. It means that uh, during the motion, very easily these nanoparticles could be um, dissociated from the track. So second, the ghost nanoparticles, I did not um, show this fully, but in fact, these nanoparticles are uh, coated with uh, DNA strands. That means they are charged. And in other words, they are repulsive. They are negatively charged. And in, uh, it also elucidates that in principle, these nanoparticles, they don't want to be close in the first place. So there are many challenges to transport these multiple nanoparticles in space simultaneously. And then my uh, PhD student tried this first with the uh, general strategy uh, strategy by utilizing toy hole strand displacement to trigger just the stepwise uh, transportation. And he failed because you see here, we started with a very good uh, assembly of the helix. So helix, um, you might recognize that. So this helical uh, structure uh, is very similar to the DNA turns. So that is why this is also a chiral structure. So he started with a very good yield of the assembly. And then after one step of transportation, that means the gold uh, nanoparticle goes in space stepwise uh, by changing its location. And then after two steps, so these nanoparticles, they have really fallen off from their track. And this really confirmed that uh, what we have worried and I have explained to you, there are many things um, which might happen to these nanoparticles. They are repulsive and they share the same track. And then how to really transport these nanoscale optical elements in space simultaneously with a very high fidelity. And then I bring, bring you this uh, analogy here. So, so we have uh, the, uh, for example, these are both gold nanoparticles. They share the same track. They have competition. And, and then uh, especially I have this kid who has really short legs. So that means um, they, they all have, especially the kid, they, they have the risk to be falling off from uh, uh, the track. And, and everyone knows that we have the solution. So we give every climber just a rope. So that if there is some danger, then the rope can just pull them back onto the track. For the transportation, for the, for the climbing. This is exactly what my PhD student did. He gave each nanoparticle a rope so that during the transportation, the nanoparticle can be directly transported in space to the desired locations. And also, here, here I'll show you, instead of the stepwise uh, transportation, we can just rely on this long rope so that these uh, nanoparticles, nanoparticles can, can be just uh, swing to the target destination. And instead of just stepwise uh, transportation, for example, from here to here, uh, the nano, this rope, which, which uh, consists of really long strands, they can just send the nanoparticles directly to the station. And this becomes very efficient. So indeed, then uh, he used this strategy, each nanoparticle here, each, each one of the nanoparticles has a long row for, for the transportation. And, and then you'll see when we transfer from left-handed uh, to right-handed uh, structure, and then uh, we have a very good yield. During the entire process, uh, the uh, structures show very good uh, fidelity. Optical spectral-wise, then we have also uh, a good confirmation of the, uh, the flipping of the structure from left-handed to the right-handed. So further on, uh, instead of just six nanoparticles, you could also do more. For example, in this case, 12, you can also do 18 or anything you, uh, you like. 
And this is called polymerization. So I, I start with this one, and then this one, I uh, attach them together, and this is called polymerization. And now, I'm, uh, in this particular case, I can end up with um, 12 nanoparticles. With the same strategy, by putting a arm for each nanoparticle, then um, we can send the nanoparticles um, to target destinations uh, in real time, simultaneously. And this is also confirmed by the uh, CD spectra. So basically, here we have the grouping of the CD uh, spectra to show the transformation from left-handed to right-handed and vice versa. So I think I, I need to really uh, end up my uh, talk here. So I, I want to just um, show you the summary of my talk. In this case, um, I um, try to convince you that it is possible to really combine different expertise from uh, multidiscipline uh, expertise uh, um, background from nano objects, from DNA nanotechnology and uh, engineering, and then we can do really artificial structures which can mimic the behavior of uh, the molecular motors in living cells. And then um, in the end, so I did not have time to cover this. So one of the motivations is that by building such artificial structures, uh, in principle, we could be able to build uh, synthetic cells so in the synthetic cell, we have artificial components, which are bio-inspired. And then in the end, they might be able to also work together just like the molecular components in living cells so that we can build uh, artificial nanofactories to, for example, produce um, the very effective and useful chemical compounds and for other functionalities. So with that, I want to also thank uh, all my students, uh, my postdocs, for their hard work, and of course, um, all the uh, funding agencies for their financial support. Uh, in the end, of course, uh, for, for your uh, time to uh, attend my talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, we now have the, the regular I would just go up and attend it. So, uh, I think we can pop this in. I was just wondering um, what drives the version of uh, the nanoparticles that is available. Mm -hmm. There is no electric field in this case, but one can utilize electric field because um, the, the particles are coated with negative DNA strands, negatively charged DNA strands. In this case, there is no electric field. So here, uh, what drives the motion is through DNA hybridization. So that means um, if I have Gaussian nanoparticle particle that is, co uh, that is coated with uh, DNA strands, I sent the DNA driving strand into the solution. So in the solution, these objects, they uh, go through a uh, Brownian motion. So that means they are never static. So they, they kind of doing the Brownian motion all the time. And that means here I have sent the DNA driving strand into the solution. So once they meet the complementary DNA strands, on my uh, gold nanoparticle, they are going to dehybridize and hybridize through the toy hold mediated strand displacement reactions. So that in um, so to make a short answer, we need the Brownian motion to trigger the process in the first place, and then we also need the hybridization and dehybridization of the DNA to trigger the motion. Does the substitution of bases by uh... The uh, in that case, yes. But uh, if there is no isobenzene, then uh, that is the fully dehybridized and hybridized uh, among the bases A, T, C, and G. Yeah. Um, and my question is, so what is the use of the molecular water in virus research? Uh, you mean the uh, in the living cells? Or just in uh, this particular case that I have shown you? Um, 
Uh -huh. So um, one of the applications would be the uh, optical sensing. So that would be a little bit similar to what I have shown you this uh, kind of rotation motion to distinguish uh, different molecular species. And that is the biological um, function part. So in nanooptics, so there is one thing which is quite interesting. So that is the light matter interaction. So we have utilized this strategy. So instead of just pure nanoplus morning system, you can imagine I could position a, a single emitter, uh, for instance, a quantum dot, uh, a dye molecule. So they are called uh, single emitters. And you can imagine that I can walk my go to nano rod. We also call them optical antenna because this is really the uh, analog of antenna so that I can get the close proximity between a quantum emitter and a gold nano rod. And this is a fully programmable platform to understand the light matter interaction because the distance control between the two objects is on the order of nanometers. And this is quite difficult to realize from other um, nanotechnics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your your experimental charts went over quite a long period, but there was distinct changes between different phases. What is the duration of that transition phase? Uh, sister again, did I hear you well? Uh, basically, I was wondering how quickly the, the changes. Oh, very uh, valid question. So. First of all, we are not comparable to the speed of molecular uh, motors. So uh, in this case, uh, in the very first case, so that was uh, this rot rotation thing. And then for each step, it took around several minutes. That was very, very slow. The thing is that um, in order to uh, just like what I have answered to that uh, lady's question, when the DNA strand is sent into the solution, then that is, the speed is diffusion limited because uh, DNA is a macromolecule. So it needs time to find its partner to hybridize and dehybridize. Therefore, this is a quite slow process. So, and then I did not uh, tell you that for this light switching case, with azobenzene, that is much faster because I don't need anything to diffuse into the solution. But still, that speed was on the order of uh, several seconds. So this is still not comparable to molecular motors. What we are trying to do is to uh, really design kind of um, very optimized enzymatic reactions, uh, also bio-inspired, and then try to optimize the uh, switching speed of the process. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is very possible. So um, in the examples I have shown you, I often, I always use identical gold nanoparticles. So then um, you can imagine if I have, uh, so there are many strategies to make multi-resonance systems. So for example, the simplest one would be that I could integrate nanoparticles with different links, gold nanorods of different links, and naturally they will just give me um, multiple resonances. Another thing I need to worry is that if I have um, go to nano rods with different links and then the resonance, they kind of deviate from each other, the coupling stress often also decreases. And it's very similar to, for example, um, you, you shake hands with your friend. If um, your friend has a similar size like you, then very easy that you guys can get resonant. Uh, they are resonantly coupled. But if you um, shake hands with a kind of a big guy, 
and then you can just be easily dragged by him. So this gives you the insight that um, in order to introduce efficient coupling, then normally we want to have the um, a very paired structure and they should have a quite similar resonance to talk. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question for the autonomous number clock. So you were talking about uh, in order for the number clock to rotate to cut the main behind them, but in uh, real ACPAs, they rotate continuously. Is there a strategy to uh, rotate the number clock uh, continuously? And is there a way to kind of uh, I don't know, I don't know, make the cut really longer? Uh, Mm -hmm. so that was a super smart <laughs> question. Yes, so this is something what, what we are working on right now. So um, there are mm, several ways, ways um, um, for the autonomous um, um, flash function. It's very, very difficult. Because, because what is it like? Um, um, I think that is a challenging to make it back. So the, um, the very, very first example is the zero rotation that always, always put in the range in the solution. That, that one is very reversible. That, that means I went on, I can still go for the further and further. That is, that is no problem. And the energy part is very, very, very difficult. We still, still don't, don't have, have the strategy to fully control. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.